Okay, so this lecture is uh, somewhat of a continuation of the EPS lecture, where we're going to focus on calculating diluted earnings per share. And so if uh, I would take a look at the basic earnings per share, the EPS uh, lecture, before jumping into this one. All right, so with diluted EPS, uh, firms oftentimes will have outstanding contracts where contract holders may induce the firm to issue more shares. Uh, those are employee stock options, convertible preferred stock, or convertible bonds. In each case, there's somebody external to the company, uh, sort of a, uh, either an employee or a preferred stockholder or a bondholder, who may force the firm to issue more shares. Uh, that will increase the number of shares outstanding and could impact earnings per share. And so firms that have a complex capital structure, like where these outstanding contracts exist, uh, they have to report diluted earnings per share in addition to their basic earnings per share. And so diluted EPS really is a worst case scenario. In other words, how low could earnings per share be if these contracts were to be executed? I want to be very clear though, these contracts are outstanding. No one has actually uh, exercised their stock options or converted their preferred stock or converted their bonds. This is just sort of a what if case. If they were to uh, exercise these options, then what would happen to earnings per share? Uh, but we do make a choice in accounting to only rep report uh, these items that would reduce earnings per share. If something is anti-dilutive, meaning that it would increase earnings per share, then we do not include it in the diluted earnings per share calculation. All right, so when we talk about employee stock options, the firm is going to, if those options were to be exercised, the firm would issue shares in exchange for cash. And so what will the firm do with the cash? Again, they haven't received the cash. This is just a what if. And so under US GAAP, the, the firm assumes that it will repurchase shares in the open market with any cash that is received. It doesn't mean that they have to. It just means when we're calculating diluted earnings per share, this is the assumption that we make. And so there is a net effect on the denominator of earnings per share. And so if we issue more shares than what we assume we would repurchase, if that happens, then that is going to dilute our EPS and we need to include those employee stock options. However, if using this assumption, we would actually decrease the number of earnings or number of shares outstanding, that would be anti-dilutive. And if it were anti-dilutive, we would ignore it for the diluted earnings per share calculation. With convertible for preferred shares and bonds, uh, the firm is going to issue shares, but no longer is going to have to pay a preferred stock dividend or incur interest expense. And so in that case, there is a numerator and also a denominator effect from each conversion. And so because there's a, an effect on both the numerator and denominator, it is not clear that each conversion would increase earnings per share or decrease earnings per share. Again, we include any conversions that would decrease earnings per share and we ignore any conversions that would increase earnings per share. And so again, the diluted EPS is a worst case scenario. All right, so we're going to continue with the example from the previous uh, lecture. And so the basic EPS from that example was 64 cents per share. And so some additional information that we're going to need to calculate diluted earnings per share First of all, convertible preferred shares have a conversion ratio of 6 to 1, and that conversion ratio is not split adjusted. We are going to assume that it's been adjusted for the stock dividend, but it, we are not, uh, it is not split adjusted. Uh, the firm has 500,000 7% 10-year annual convertible bonds. Each has a 1,000 par value. The bonds were issued initially at 98, and the firm uses straight line method to amortize the bond discount. Uh, the conversion ratio for these bonds is 40 to 1, and this has also not been split adjusted. Uh, firm employees currently hold two series of outstanding options. Uh, the first series is, series is 15,000 options with an exercise price of $25 per share, and that has not been split adjusted. And the second series has 8,000 options with an exercise price of $35 per share, and that also has not been split adjusted. The average market price for the firm's stock was $14 per share over the fiscal year, and the firm's tax rate is 35%. Okay, uh, first, we're going to assume that the contracts are adjusted for the stock dividend, as I said, but not the stock split. 
And so we have to start by including the effects of any in the money stock options. Again, uh, those are those uh, options where there are going to be more shares issued than are repurchased. And so the easiest way to determine this is to compare the exercise or strike price to the average market price. All right, the average market price is $14 per share. For the first series, uh, we have to get the split adjusted exercise prices. And so for the first series, the split adjusted price is $12.50. That is lower than the market price, and that means that the option is in the money. The second series split adjusted price is $17.50. It is more than the market price, and therefore it is out of the money. Again, we include in the money stock options. We do not include out of the money stock options. And so we include the Series 1 stock options. Then we're going to issue 15,000 shares. After the split adjustment, we would actually issue 30,000 shares. The cash that's going to be received, again, the split adjusted price is $12.50. And so for those 30,000 shares, we would receive $12.50 per share, or a total of $375,000. Again, by assumption, we would assume that they would repurchase shares in the open market at $14 per share, meaning they could repurchase 26,785 shares. I want to be very clear, the number of shares that we repurchase is uh, truncated. In other words, we can't, even let's say it was 26 point, or 26,785 shares, you know, point nine 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 nine. Well, you can't buy 99% of a share, and so in that case, we always truncate. Uh, we don't round, we truncate. And so the net number of shares issued is 3,215. The 30,000 shares that are issued less the 26,785 shares that we assume we would repurchase. And so there's a new earnings per share once we include the stock options. And so our new diluted EPS, instead of being um, uh, 296 over 464,000. We have to include the new shares that are issued. And so our new diluted EPS is 0.6335 per share. So now we're going to examine the preferred stock conversion. Again, there is a numerator and a denominator effect. And so the numerator, in this case, they would no longer have to pay the preferred stock dividend. So the numerator is going to increase $7,000. There are 1,000 preferred convertible shares, and that the conversion ratio in the contract is 6 to 1. Once we split adjust that, we have to multiply that by 2. And so that means if the preferred shares were converted, we would issue 12,000 common shares. And so the preferred stock conversion effects is 0.5833 per share. When we compare that to the earnings per share of 0.6335, we could see that it is potentially dilutive if it were included. Again, the, know, the way that we know that it's potentially dilutive is that the preferred stock conversion effect is less than the earnings per share. As long as it's less, then it's potentially dilutive. If it were more, then it would be anti-dilutive. So now we're going to examine the bond conversion. Again, there is a numerator and a denominator effect. The numerator effect is a little more complicated, um, and, and the reason why is because interest expense is, an, uh, is a before-tax expense, and we need the after-tax income effect on the numerator. And so that's why that first term is 1 minus 0.35. That gives us the after-tax effect given a tax rate of 35%. We also have to figure out what the interest expense would be. Well, the, the bond uh, payment is 7%, but there's also a discount under the straight line method. And the amortization of that discount on an annual basis is $1,000. And so that means we have to combine the amortization of the discount and the interest payment in order to get the interest expense. And so that's why we have 7% times the 500,000 that gives us the interest payment. And we add the amortization of the discount and that gives us the total interest expense on an annual basis. And the after tax amount of that is $23,400. We also have those 500 bonds and the conversion ratio is four to one that was not split adjusted. And so we have to multiply that conversion ratio by two. And so that means we would issue 40,000 shares if these bonds were, be, were to be converted. And so the bond conversion effect is 0.585 per share. And since it is less than the earnings per share that we have after the stock options, it is potentially dilutive.
Now this next step is a little more complicated, but we have two conversions, uh, both the preferred stock and the bond, and both of them are potentially dilutive. And so we have to make sure that we approach this in the right way so that we can make sure we get the right answer. All right, so we are going to include the preferred stock conversion first because it has the most dilutive potential. Uh, if you kind of think about um, the preferred stock conversion, the, the, the effect was 0.5833, whereas with the bond it was 0.585. And so the preferred stock conversion is lower, that, that, that uh, ratio is lower, so it has the most dilutive potential. That's where we need to start. And so when we include the preferred stock conversion, we do get a new diluted EPS. So, so you can see there's a change in the numerator and also a change in the denominator. And the new diluted earnings per share is 0.6323 per share. And so we now need to compare this number uh, to our bond conversion um, effect to see if that bond conversion effect would still be dilutive. And of course, since the bond conversion effect is 0.585, uh, it would still be dilutive. All right, so now again we have a numerator and a denominator effect, and now we have a new diluted EPS based on the after bond conversion amount. And so our reported diluted EPS, just like basic EPS, is reported to the nearest penny, and so we report 0.63 cents per share for our diluted EPS.